welcome back to this course on nanostructured materials synthesis properties and applications today is the uh, concluding lecture of this course uh, which spanned over uh, 40 lectures in four modules so today is the 12th lecture of module 4 and the 40th lecture of the overall course on nanostructured materials and in this uh, course uh, we have covered various aspects of nanotechnology from synthesis to applications. So, uh, module 4 we are referring today to module 4 lecture 12 and this is the concluding lecture the last lecture on this course of nanostructured materials synthesis structure and properties. So, what did we learn in this course? Uh, we learned that what is a nanomaterial. Okay. So, for example, we defined a any nanomaterial having size between 1 to 100 nanometer. Uh, this is considered to be a region where any particle, any object having this size we refer to that as nano material. Now, with that size there has to be some change in property in the uh, type of uh, property may be a magnetic property an optical property etcetera. So, what are these different properties which occur at this nano scale. For example, we learned that uh, gold if you reduce the size of gold it can have different colors depending on what is the size. So, gold is normally yellow in color it can be uh, red in color or green in color depending on the size of the particles of gold. So, this is the optical property of nanoparticles an example of a metal nanoparticle. Similarly, we looked at optical properties of semiconductor nanoparticles for example, quantum dots. So, what are quantum dots for example, we studied quantum dots like cadmium selenide or cadmium sulphide. If you make particles of such semiconductors uh, which uh, fall in the dimensions of uh, less than say 10 nanometer, then you can see uh, quantum size effects and quantum size effects lead to uh, changes in the energy band diagrams right and this change in the energy band diagram leads to change in the color. So, based on that uh, we call them quantum dots if they are spherical. Okay. However, we can also uh, discuss nanoparticles not only in three dimensions, but in one dimension or two dimensions. So, in one dimension for example, you have a long wire. Okay. Now, this may be a few nanometers okay. say 1 or 5 to 20 nanometers or 30 nanometers whereas, this is like 5000 nanometer okay, which is like 5 microns. Okay. Then this will be called a, a quantum wire okay. or this is a one dimensional nano structure. So, different types of nano structures we studied they can be uh, zero dimensional like uh, quantum dots, uh, one dimensional like quantum wires or they can be a uh, plate like objects which are like two dimensions are in nanometer scale uh, uh, and you can have the length and breadth. For example, you can have something uh, in nanometer dimensions in this direction. Okay. And in this case, you have these large in say micron dimension. Okay. So, in a plate, you can have a nano dimension. 
but you can also have a kind of quantum wire where you have these two dimensions are in nanometers whereas this is in a uh, micron sized okay so this, this is the quantum wire uh, we are referring to okay so two dimension are in nanometers and it is uh, in one dimension is very large so this is a quantum wire it's called one dimensional nano structure and this is like 2d or you can have what is called a quantum well so many such properties in nano structures we learnt lead to the quantum regime so lot of properties will change when something goes to the quantum regime this is one important thing we learned and we looked at several such uh, materials including semiconductors and metals and even uh, something like organic nanostructures like uh, carbon nanotubes etc so carbon nanotubes are like 1d nanostructures but it is made up of carbon and not metal or semiconducting uh, uh, inorganic semiconductors of course you can have metallic carbon nanotubes as well as semiconducting carbon nanotubes so you can have different types of nanostructures that is the basic thing now looking at properties we looked at optical properties we looked at magnetic properties for example uh, main main change which happens when something is magnetic okay so when you have something like iron oxide which is magnetic magnetic here means ferromagnetic and when you uh, decrease the size uh, what is the key change in this property so what we get is the reversal of the magnetization so you have a material which is uh, ferromagnetic and as you decrease the size of the particle the magnetization changes over from ferromagnetic to you get a less ferromagnetic so the magnetization is much less or it may become anti ferromagnetic so there is a reversal in the magnetization and you also result in something called a super paramagnet Okay, at a particular uh, when you make small sized magnetic particles and then we also looked at what are the applications of such magnetic nanoparticle and they have huge applications especially in drug delivery etcetera where if you make conjugates of uh, the uh, magnetic particle say you have a magnetic nanoparticle and you make a conjugate with a drug so this will be called a bio conjugate and this can be used to for drug delivery since you can guide the uh, drug which is attached to the magnetic nanoparticle uh, based on a magnetic field so you, since the magnetic uh, nanoparticle uh, will move as you guide it with a magnetic field and along with that it will carry the drug particle and take it to the place where the magnetic nanoparticle is being guided to so that is the way uh, you can make uh, drug delivery possible using the magnetic property of nanoparticles so this is another key important property we studied in magnetic in nano dimensions uh, where its use in medicine and drug delivery has been discussed in this course however in magnetic nanoparticles being used for drug delivery the size of the nanoparticle is not critically low like required for observation of quantum phenomena so you can use large sized nanoparticle for example 100 nanometer particle can be used for 
drug delivery. It need not be 2 nanometer or 5 nanometer etcetera, which is essential to see quantum effects, uh, but that is not necessary that size is not necessary for looking at the magnetic properties of nanoparticles for uh, uh, in drug delivery or in nano medicine. So, these are some simple differences when you do nanoparticles for various applications you have to keep in mind that if you are looking for an application which depends on the quantum effect of nanoparticle, then you have to work with very small particles of the range of uh, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 10 nanometers. Whereas, if you are looking for uh, a, an application involving some uh, a biomolecule or conjugation to a drug molecule, then that size can be larger can be 40 nanometers, 50 nanometers, then it will depend on some other properties like what is the size of particle which will penetrate across a cell wall, is it important. Those or which will go move across a membrane in a uh, living system, those will be concerns which are of more interest uh, rather than the quantum effects of the nanoparticle. So, one has to keep in mind these things. So, uh, we uh, certainly discussed optical properties and magnetic properties and uh, uh, there are other effects of uh, nano dimension materials which we uh, discussed. For example, uh, you have something like a field emission. So, field emission means you uh, apply an electric field and you get electrons. So, you apply an electric field and electrons are ejected out of the material. So, uh, if you have a nanostructure with a fine tip, then it is easy for electrons to come out. So, many one dimensional nanostructures of materials like lanthanum hexaboride or carbon nanotubes uh, have been used to make field emitters. And here the dimensions of these uh, rods and especially at the tip what is the diameter that is very important a sharp tip uh, will be very good for the electron emission. And so, these properties again field emission uh, depends a lot on how you have created these nanostructures. So, there are several techniques on the synthesis. So, few of these particles uh, I just went through. Now, uh, the synthesis also we discussed in a very elaborate fashion. Uh, for example, you have the top down method and where you have a large particle and then you slowly break it into small particles, many small particles. So, this is the top down approach and this is also called the physical uh, route and it is uh, highly energy intensive. Okay. But the bottom up approach is also called the chemical routes where you start with small you know these are say in molecules or ions okay so these are say in solution and from that you build them so you assemble these particles such that this becomes a nanoparticle so uh, this is the chemical route where you are taking small sized objects and assembling them. So, you have top down method and you have bottom up method, this is a physical method, energy in intensive you may need lasers or you may need electron beam or ion beams. So, high energy situation whereas, here you do work with solutions and chemistry etcetera. And some of the important chemical routes uh, we discussed are for example, the uh, solvo thermal routes and uh, then which of course, includes hydrothermal if the solvent is water then it is the hydrothermal route 
and uh, you also uh, we discussed uh, surfactant mediated roots. So, you can use surfactant as templates and you can also use surfactant to make micro emulsions and using micro emulsions especially reverse micelles. we can control the size of particles very effectively. So, apart from that uh, you can work with for example, sono chemistry, where you use something like ultrasound. So, various methods uh, have been used and these are all uh, we can consider as chemical roots although sono chemistry you are using ultrasound, but again you are putting them in solutions. So, and there the control in this of the size and shape of the particles is quite effective and that we discussed in uh, great detail. So, you can make bulk particles that means, powder particles uh, which are nano crystalline uh, both by physical methods which are the top down methods and the chemical methods which are uses the soft root at low temperatures solution based methods in which you add sometimes templates like surfactants to control the size and shape of particles. Now, these are polycrystalline samples and you can make powders. So, but suppose for applications you want to make devices etcetera then you may need to make nanostructured films. So, that also we uh, discussed. So, nanostructured uh, films if you want to make then uh, you have to uh, use some other techniques. So, typically you have a substrate and on that substrate you want some uh, structures which are grown on the substrate. And uh, how you do that you can do by what is called a common chemical vapor deposition route. So, on this substrate you can have pillars of or wires of nano structures and here the, uh, the wires themselves may be long may be micron size but their diameter is nanometer diameter. Okay. So, these lengths can be long or sometimes even the length can be nanometer dimension. So, you can have this kind of columnar or you, you can have particles which are assembled on top of the substrate. So, one of the methods is CVD, but again you have various other techniques you can do what is called LB film techniques, Langmuir Blodgett film techniques as a chemical route or you can do physical vapor deposition routes uh, which include uh, either uh, resistive heating through a wire or you can use electron beam etcetera. So, many of these nano structured films can be prepared and uh, all kinds of nanostructures are now known uh, which can be prepared in large quantities and one of the most important materials in uh, nanotechnology is carbon based nanostructures and that has been studied to great extent how to grow good quality uh, carbon nanofibers on top of substrates and use them for different applications. So, growing nanostructured films is uh, again a uh, very important method because ultimately to make a device uh, typically you need films and the substrate can change depending on your application. So, synthesis of nano powders, synthesis of nano crystals and nano structured films uh, both been covered in this uh, course in great detail. Now, uh, if you want to study uh, characterize. So, one is uh, looking at how to make them, 
then after making them you want to characterize. So, we went into all the techniques that are commonly used like x ray diffraction, how to find the particle size etcetera. So, you use what is called the Scherer equation for, for finding the crystallite size. And uh, uh, you can also use what is called dynamic light scattering, where you use a laser light which scatters and finds the size of the particle, but here it is called particle size or grain size. And it is different from crystallite size, particle size and crystallite size will be same only if these particles are single crystals because x ray finds out the using the Scherer equation the size uh, based on assuming uh, the each crystal. Whereas, in light scattering you it will find an object which is diffusing at a particular velocity and from that try to calculate using uh, the Stokes Einstein equation about the size of the particle. So, it does not look at only whether it is single crystal or not, it finds a particle and the particle can be made of 4, 5 crystals together. So, then you will get an overall size in DLS, whereas in X ray even if you have this kind of uh, uh, agglomerates, you will get only the size of a single crystal which is forming the agglomerate. So, that is why normally crystallite size will always be smaller, whereas light scattering will give you particle size which is larger and the two will be same the crystallite size and the particle size only when these particles are single crystalline then these two sizes will vanish. this is an important difference between crystallite size and particle size. So, you characterize the size using x ray or light scattering or using electron microscopy. So, microscopy is an important technique in nanotechnology and you can do scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy and we have discussed them in great detail to look at the particles. If you have very small particles and you want to see high resolution, then you do what is called HRTEM. That means, you need a very high resolution and careful study, where you can then look at an array of particles, array of atoms and sometimes you can go atomic resolution and so you can find out exactly what is the size of your particle and also the phases which you are seeing. Okay. So, HRTEM is uh, nothing but transmission electron microscopy, but you are doing in the high resolution mode and apart from that you can find the composition of the particles etcetera using electron microscopy by doing what is called the EDX. Uh, electron uh, diffraction uh, energy dispersive x ray analysis, or sometimes it is also called EDS, is the same thing which is basically analyzes, is the analysis of the material and it gives you the composition. So, if you have an EDAX attached to a TEM, you can do what is called TEM EDAX and it is more precise because you are looking at very small grains, but if you are doing with SEM EDX. So, the EDX the detector is attached to the scanning electron microscope, uh, it is the it looks at a much larger uh, area and not individual grains in an SEM and so you get a average composition. So, average composition over many grains uh, you get in SEM, whereas in TEM you can get more precise composition of single grains at which you are looking at. So, these are uh, methods by which you can find the composition of the nanoparticles. So, these are uh, you, for characterization you do x-ray diffraction, light scattering and my electron microscopy to get the uh, size of the particle, the shape of the particle, the composition of the particle. Now, if you want to look at 
what is the charge on the surface of the particle. So, what is the charge on the surface? Then you do what is called a zeta potential method measurement and this zeta potential is uh, related to what is called Henry's law and uh, the instrumentation that you use is basically uh, comes along with the light scattering machine. So, a DLS machine is attached with you can analyze using a uh, what is called a zeta sizer or uh, you can analyze the zeta potential uh, using a, uh, a light scattering machine with proper attachments. Okay. And you can also study variation of the zeta potential as you are changing the pH of the system. So, it is possible to study which is a very important study to understand how the pH is controlling the surface charge. So, that kind of work is possible in modern day equipments where light scattering and zeta potential both can be measured and also measured as a function of change in the pH of the system. So, uh, these are some techniques by which you can measure the uh, particle size, shape and surface charge of the system. Now, uh, the two main equipments which change the face of nanotechnology by because of which nanotechnology became very important or very famous uh, are the AFM and the STM. So, the discovery of AFM and STM uh, by uh, Benig and Roherer who got the Nobel prize along with uh, uh, Ruska who had discovered the uh, electron microscope long back. So, three of them got the Nobel prize, but this was in around 1985-86 that these two were discovered and hence nanotechnology became very important after 1985-86 in the 1990s. And the atomic force microscope uh, can measure uh, all all type of samples, whereas STM measures mainly conducting samples. So here, uh, tunneling current is measured. and here force is important. What is the force felt by the cantilever when it comes close to the surface? So, they, the two are different measurements they tell you a lot about the nanostructure present and these two probes have been expanded to introduce many many new methodologies for example, MFM which is the magnetic force microscopy. You can map out in a sample regions of high magnetization, low magnetization etcetera. These are nothing but how the AFM has been modified, the tip has been modified with a magnetic probe which looks onto the surface. So, all types of uh, techniques you can have, you can have what is called the scanning uh, electrochemical microscope and like that many many uh, microscopes are possible. All together they are called SPM which is which means scanning probe microscopy. So, scanning probe microscopy is the common name for this whole lot of techniques which is the cornerstone of nanotechnology and one uh, comes across measurements using some form or the other of the scanning probe microscopy in this area of research or uh, of nano science and nanotechnology. So, the basics of AFM, STM etcetera we have discussed in length and we have looked at the images that they generate and how to understand 
nanostructures using scanning probe microscopy has been delved in great detail in this course. Uh, now, apart from these uh, x-ray techniques, microscopy and scanning probe techniques, what are the other techniques that people uh, uh, are using? Now, this uh, AFM uh, people also use in conjunction with what is called confocal uh, microscopy. So, uh, nowadays we will, you can look at an object and especially in uh, bio related problems of nano science, you can make use of confocal microscopy to a great extent. And then you can also do what is called confocal Raman as a technique to understand the Raman signals which are coming from specific regions from a sample. So, if you have a sample say a nanoparticle like this and you want to study a, a small portion is uh, of this and there is another portion which has a different kind of feature. So, you have say looked at this using scanning probe techniques and this is looks different than this and you want to look at whether uh, the Raman active modes here are different from that. So, you can uh, use a confocal Raman micro micro probe to understand uh, what is happening when you uh, pass a light beam and understand the scattered radiations which are coming out from this point and you can also focus at this point. So, you can do confocal Raman at different positions and from the signals that they give, you can understand the differences of the region here and the region there. So, confocal Raman uh, uh, is a very, very important technique to understand the different types of phases which are present in nanostructures. More importantly, uh, confocal uh, microscopy with the fluorescent markers is very important in uh, bio related problems. So, you can study the fluorescence of a dye uh, which is entered into some cell under the confocal microscope and you can understand how it is present and whether it is migrating somewhere etcetera. And you can also do spectroscopy at different points and together this technique of confocal uh, microscopy, confocal imaging which tells you, uh, it gives you an image of uh, these nanostructures with respect to especially which are related to uh, bio or uh, cellular uh, objects. Uh, you can understand many of the processes, very important processes using imaging uh, in a confocal microscope. So, this confocal microscopy is again uh, kind of become a uh, tool, basic tool like the AFM, the confocal microscope a basic tool in a of uh, any lab which is working on nano science or nanotechnology. And especially if you are working in any biology related problem, then this confocal microscopy becomes very important. The confocal Raman of course, is more important for people who are working on materials, nano materials, uh, uh, the carbon based compounds nanostructures for that the Raman spectroscopy is very important and hence if you could, can do confocal Raman, uh, then you can look at the Raman signals from different parts of the same material within nanostructured uh, domains. So, th this is a great uh, uh, advancement in the technology that we have today to understand nanostructures. Then we have uh, lithography by which we can make patterns in nanometer dimensions. So, this is very important because you are trying to make ultimately devices which will have contacts and hence you need patterning with some 
material and this patterning should be as low as possible to make smaller and smaller devices and so how to achieve that. So, this lithography that is making a uh, kind of uh, designing something using a very fine uh, beam of lasers or electrons or ions. So, you can have ion e beam or ion beam or you can use what is called a laser writer. So, by doing this you can make patterns. So, you can make patterns like for example, you make lines like this. Now, if you want to make patterns regular lines and the dimensions you want to keep nanometer dimensions and maybe the gap is slightly more than few nanometer. This may be 5 nanometer, this may be 20 nanometer. This repetitive structure if you want you this patterning has to be done by uh, things like E beam or ion beam or laser writing etcetera. And so, we have now commercial uh, E beam writers. So, you can have like uh, in an electron microscope here also you can have a source of electrons, but then that electron beam can be manipulated. So, that it can move like moving of a pen. So, you can manipulate the electron beam like you can manipulate the pen. So, and hence it is called a E beam lighter because what you are writing here in ink you are writing with electrons. So, that is called an E beam writer. So, you are you need to control the electron beam very carefully and commercial machines are available where you can use E beam writing to make patterns. So, uh, and that is called E beam lithography and you can even have robotic arms to move the samples within the E beam writer and place it such that you do not uh, very accurate uh, uh, positioning of the sample can be done. So, accurate positioning of the sample is important because otherwise you will you cannot make uh, 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 patterns which are nanometer dimensions unless you have very accurate position systems. So, these are now available. So, the technology has really moved in uh, uh, finding out methods how you can make finer and finer tracks or circuits based on some material. So, you can write with any atom. So, you can have use an ion source to pattern uh, a particular kind of element on top of the substrate. So, this can this has been people have been doing for some time like that we discussed many other methods how you can make patterns on surfaces and E beam writing is one such method. So, uh, lithography is a uh, big uh, and challenging uh, problem for a problem and also solution for nanotechnology, uh, which requires uh, advanced laboratory, which requires clean rooms and uh, uh, everything has to be dust free. You have instruments within clean rooms and you have to have uh, characterization facilities within clean rooms, because you are talking of very, very small dimensions and in such uh, kind of E beam writing or ion beam writing, if there are dust particles they will scatter them and you will not get any accuracy. So, a very important thing in uh, nanotechnology especially uh, if you are working in nano electronics, where you are trying to pattern circuits is you need very good clean rooms and these clean rooms are quite expensive, because you need to design these clean rooms with uh, uh, some uh, particular conditions and flow rate of air and uh, filters for removing particles above a certain size and based on these filters and what size of particles cannot enter that room. Uh, you have what we call class several classes of clean room. So, class 
ten, class hundred, uh, class thousand. So these tell you that you cannot, you have a room which is class ten, means particles smaller than ten microns cannot enter that room. So you have filters which can fill. This is this will be very expensive. And normally class ten, uh, you normally have a small region in the laboratory which may be a small hood or something which is class 10. Ideally clean rooms are class 100 or class 1000 or class 10,000. So, class 10,000 is like not that great for doing nano electronics works. So, it depends on what kind of work you plan to do in the clean rooms, uh, what kind of lithography you plan to do in the clean rooms uh, that will tell you what kind of class of clean room you must have and and making a clean room itself is a uh, very challenging and technical problem uh, which of course uh, has been developed and there are many companies which make clean rooms etc so this is uh, especially if you are working in nano electronics etc but uh, if you are working with the solution based techniques uh, and you want to pattern something, then uh, a technique like dip pen uh, lithography can be used, where it uses a solution with molecules and uh, this is based on like your inkjet printer uh, prints uh, on your paper. Like that you can have dip pen lithography and you can have arrays of molecules of your choice and you can make patterns out of these molecules. So, this is solution based, it is a less expensive does not need the type of clean rooms which you need to do nano electronics and many many places such uh, lithography is sufficient, but to do really high quality nano electronics you need to have clean rooms of the best quality. So, uh, these are several of the uh, characterization uh, techniques which uh, we have done or fabrication techniques which we have discussed in various uh, parts of the course. And uh, uh, apart from uh, writing on uh, substrates etcetera, we also discussed how uh, people have worked on making devices like uh, you can have a carbon nanotube and then join to a platinum wire. So, such kind of things people have done, this is like people welding two wires. So, this kind of welding of wires here nano wires has been done by several groups in the world. We have discussed the kind of uh, uh, devices which have been made out of uh, these kind of welding of wires in some uh, cases. Now, you can some of the very good applications where nano science or nano technology or these nano structured materials will be useful. Uh, let me uh, mention in conclusion uh, that where are we going to use these nano science and nano technology. So, for example, one of the places which people really want to use the uh, study of nano structured materials is in nano medicine. So, a uh, lot of research is going on targeted drug delivery or uh, related aspects and also people are trying to make uh, nano capsules with the drug inside. So, in nano medicine this tremendous hope. The other area of course, is nano electronics if you can make smaller and smaller chips and increase the memory of the devices. Then uh, a lot of interest is there in uh, photocatalysis. So, make nano structured materials which are very good photocatalysts and this is from the environmental point of view. So, one of the most popular 
nanomaterials is TiO2 and this is used to uh, split organics to carbon dioxide and water. So, by that you want to clean the environment. So, then the fourth thing is can we use nanostructured materials for generation of hydrogen by water splitting. So, since fuel is becoming uh, there is a lack of fuel in the uh, on the earth soon we will be uh, having no petroleum and even coal will finish by 2100. You need to have alternative sources of energy and hydrogen is being uh, touted as one of the areas where you can use hydrogen to generate energy, but how do you get hydrogen easily? One is by water splitting and what will do the water splitting some catalyst and which catalyst you will choose your nano catalyst and so there is lot of work in the type of nano catalyst for generation of hydrogen by water splitting this is a very very challenging problem. So, now we are discussing what is the future of nano science and nanotechnology and where it will probably be applicable. So, nano medicine, nano electronics, photocatalysis for environmental uh, purposes, then generation of hydrogen, then lot of interest is there now in applications of nano science uh, in agriculture say can you protect the seeds by giving some coating of coated with nanoparticle. So, there are a lot of interest in finding out applications of nano science in agriculture. Then uh, people are interested in making uh, materials for fuel cells. So, the electrode materials which are applicable for fuel cells in the nano size to make if not a nano fuel cell, but you can think of what is called a micro fuel cell. So, fuel cell uh, uses hydrogen and reacts with oxygen to give you energy and water. So, the byproduct in a fuel cell is energy and a byproduct is water. So, it is a very clean form of energy and lot of work is going on in trying to fabricate micro fuel cells using nano structured materials as electrolytes or that is solid electrolytes or as electrodes. So, various such aspects of nano science and nanotechnology are there. A very important application is in sensors. So, lot of material in nano structured materials are being used for say sensors for ammonia, for methane and to detect these type of uh, gases and also sensors for explosives. So, lot of research is going on how to use nano structured materials to detect explosives like TNT or RDX etcetera. So, there is lot of research already some work has been uh, has already come out from different countries on these materials. So, several such applications are there and what I went through are few of them which we have discussed in the whole course. So, with this I would like to uh, wrap up this course and uh, I hope that uh, you have gone through the whole course material by now and got a feeling for what nano structured materials are, how they can be synthesized and how their properties can be measured, what are the key techniques which 
anybody who is practicing nano science and nanotechnology uh, has to have or has to find to do work on nanostructured materials and what is the scope of applications. We see there is wide ranging scope of applications of nanostructured materials right from medicine to agriculture including electronics and uh, it will be an area which will be more and more uh, interesting for uh, the people who are coming in future and it is an interdisciplinary subject. So, it does not matter whether you are a chemist or a biologist or an engineer nanotechnology has a room for everybody. The interest is to make a device using the uh, properties of nanostructured materials and that device should be uh, miniaturized and it helps solve a problem. So, most of the time to solve a problem to make a device using materials uh, using nanostructured materials you will have to have an interdisciplinary kind of approach and you will have to interact with people of different origin. Maybe an electronics engineer has to interact with a biologist or a chemical engineer has to interact with a mechanical engineer and a chemist to fabricate a uh, device through which say nanoparticles are flowing in a fluid and cooling something. So, uh, I did not touch upon this too much, but there are things called nano fluids by which you can do heat exchange very, very uh, much better than conventional uh, cooling agents. So, this is an area which is important from the nano structured materials point of view and also from the mechanical engineering point of view, because mechanical engineers are involved in designing heat exchangers. So, this is this is an example how two very different fields a chemist who is making nanomaterials and a mechanical engineer who is designing a heat exchanger come together in an area called nanofluids, which once flowing through a tube can cool the environment around it. Similarly, if you want to make a micro fuel cell you need a chemical engineer who is designing the fuel cell with a nano structured materials person who is making the electrodes made of nano materials. And this kind of overlap of areas is the hallmark of nano uh, science and technology and nano structured materials uh, will form the key to many, many applications in future. So, with these words let me thank all of you for taking part in this course and attending this course and I hope you will be able to answer all the questions which will be given as, uh, as a part of this course and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.